I'm Mel Stewart, and this is the Swim Swam Podcast. Joining me today is a very, very, very special guest, an Olympic champion, two-time Olympic medalist, and allegedly Eddie Reese's favorite sprint freestyler who is currently practicing law, Jimmy Allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> Allegedly, so here we go. We got we got to talk about it. Um, you're, you're you're practicing law. What what do you what kind of law are you practicing? I'm in. I'm doing some planks work right now. So uh, I'm with the. You just put, you you clicked out for one second. Say it again. Oh, sorry, I'm doing plaintiffs work. So uh, I'm I'm out there making sure people are 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 being recouped for their injuries, making sure that those big bad insurance companies are paying the policies they need to pay, and uh, that's my life right now. You're, 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 those guys do well. Uh, yeah, so I'm doing it. <laughs> they, 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 no, do really, uh, they do really well. Here's the thing. You're not going to, I was, I, I did not know. And uh, I was, I, I apologize. But you know, the funny thing is I do think of you, when I think of you in my brain, it's like swim and always getting up there to swim the 50 or 100 free and your smiling face. And when you said, no, nah, I'm, I'm practicing law, I was like, what? You made, me, you made me feel old. <laughs> oh, I feel old every day. So you're not alone there, Mel. So don't worry about that. Um, I love that you still live in Austin and that you're practicing law in Austin. I love it here. It's been my home ever since I got here back in 2008, if you can believe it. Uh, but Austin's always been home. I've really identified with this city. I've made it, I've made it a place where I can live, grow, and raise a family. So it's my home and it probably always will be. Well, how to unpack Jimmy Fegan in 30, 35 minutes. It's very difficult. There's a whole lot there. Uh, uh, let's go. Let's, shallow. It's not, no, it's not shallow. Let's go back to, let's go back to high school. I forgot about this. I forgot that out of high school, you were coming out of high school, 4308, 100 yard free. Who were you? Four, 1949? No. 1949, 50 free. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, I think down to the 100th. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, that's blazing. Was it San Antonio? We were out of San Antonio. Was that of San Antonio Churchill High School? And uh, so I, I didn't know this. I, I remember this. This is weird thing from your bio that you were born in Hawaii. So w at what point did you did you matriculate to Texas? So I actually had the best you know time of my life in Hawaii. Uh, I've been trying to relive those moments. That was uh, back when I was six months old. So, uh, didn't have long there. I, I left almost immediately out of Hawaii after I was born, moved to Harlingen, Texas. And that's kind of where, uh, my swimming kind of began, I guess would be, would be in Hawaii. I was water safe very early and then just kind of took a liking to it. And parents threw me into it when, when we got to Texas. So, uh, it's his, everything else history. I, being a 4305, 19, 4950 free out of San Antonio. Did you take trips to other schools or was it like, I, they, we're not even going to call him. He's going, he's going to go swim for Eddie. Did you take trips, take recruiting trips? Well, you might find this interesting. When I was kind of going through the process, I had no interest in Texas. I wanted out of Texas. I did not want to go to Texas at all. The only reason I even took a trip there was because my parents wanted me to go to Texas. I wanted to get out. I was looking at USC and Arizona were my main, my big contenders. Uh, but ultimately it came down to, you know, it came down to a decision of where, where did I see myself growing? Where would I have the support that I needed? And Texas was the spot that my parents, myself and my coaches kind of came to a decision that would, that would be where I would grow and I would become hopefully the swimmer that, uh, that reaches, you know, my maximum potential. So that's kind of been where that's, that's really where it all started. And thank goodness that my parents and coaches were looking out for me because I don't, I, it seemed like at 18, I had all the answers. Now looking back, I actually had no answers. I had no idea what I was doing. So I really had the support that I needed that, that allowed me to flourish and got me to the place where I needed to be and, and to be the most effective swimmer that I could be. 
Um, I had a great way to segue into another conversation. For people who are listening to this as a download, some people do watch this as video, and I'm just kind of curious about the framing of, of, of what we have on video here. It seems like you frame this so that your head is just poking up out of the corner, and there's a cat, <laughs> there's, a pill, there's a cat pillow in the background. There, there, the there is, here, here she is. Uh, so I'm actually sitting on the floor, the laptop's on the couch, it's being charged, so I can't get it quite to the table. So that's my framing idea here. So I'm sorry guys, if you're watching my video, his head's just gonna float up here in the corner and that's how it's gonna work, you know, <laughs> it's floating down. <laughs> okay, so you're, you're a high school kid, you, you, you know, most kids wanna, they, they, they do, they wanna get out of the state. They wanna live a little bit, they wanna experience something, but you didn't know as an 18 year old that basically Austin was the epicenter of all things. I've traveled the world. I've lived in New York City, Los Angeles, Pennsylvania, North Carolina. I've traveled every, you know, abroad. Austin is it, but you didn't know that. When did you fall in love with Austin? How did it happen? Uh, I'm sure just like you, it was, it was a slow process and then all at once, right? So I loved it when I was here in college. And then when I went pro, I got to experience some time here. Uh, I, I got to see some of my highest highs and my lowest lows here. And each time I found more support and I found more friends and I found a new unique aspect of Austin that made it more that, that spoke to me personally. So it just kind of all snowballed into this place where, wow, I'm going to live here one day. And my time at North Carolina uh, with David Marsh, which was a great time. I loved Charlotte, but it was never really quite home. It was never really quite Austin. And whenever I thought about going back to Austin or going back to Texas. It's just, it was always, it was always going back to Austin. It was never going anywhere else. So I've known it was my home for a, a good amount of time, but I can't really pinpoint the exact time, you know, probably sometime during uh, my first year as pro, you know, back in 2013, probably somewhere around there where this city really just kind of just became my home and where I'm from and, and the city that defines me. So that's where it's been. Oh, I get it. We got some parallels. So just for people listening, um, full disclosure, uh, we're going to go through all of Jimmy's history. When I, when I, when I went back, when I was looking into his, into his bios and cross-referencing, I forgot about the 16 incident and people know what that is. And I talked to Jimmy about it before he goes, yeah, you can ask me about it. We're going to talk about it later in the podcast. But we also, we, uh, m by the way, my wife was like, if you had been there, you'd have been in that car. <laughs> Just like, you'd, have, you'd, have, you'd have been in that taxi. You're so lucky you weren't in Rio. Um, because we'll talk about this later. We're going we're gonna to talk about your career. We're going to talk. So David Marsh, you swam with David Marsh, and, uh, which means that you never swam more than a 12 and a half fast for a period of time in practice, right? Uh, well, that's what I thought. But let me tell you what, maybe they were only 12 and a half, but we do about 20 of them. And they were tough. So I, I know that it's so funny. Poor Dave gets this, uh, this cream puff coach, you know, willy frilly stuff. Uh, but man, does it work. And man, is it tough. Being under Eddie and being under, uh, you know, Dave, probably pretty close to polar opposite coaches and coaching style and status. And uh, I thought that they both, have their absolute pros, right? And not too many cons, as you can see from their swimmers, they swim fast every year. So they've always got people in the top, you know, in the top five. So that's kind of where I, I land with those two coaches. I was so blessed to have both, you know, one of the rare guys that got both Eddie and Dave. Uh, and, and I'm just so appreciative of it because it allowed me to become the swimmer that I was. Uh, and that is just a truly invaluable experience that I know are, is continuing on to this day for those coaches. So very diplomatic of you, but I'll break it down for our audience. You trained 400 AM under Eddie, cause that's the way you trained. You, and you trained, you trained for the 12 and a half sprint under David Marsh. And Absolutely. that's the truest statement as it comes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Everyone's a 400 IM or under Eddie and everyone's a sprinter under Dave. So yeah, but, and Eddie does, they do. I've sat in on this practices. Eddie had Eddie, deliver he, he serves up honest work that's yes. a good way to put it it's a good way to put it yes it, it's uh, he's been around a long time he, he he will do the honest work and david i swam with david i would did a lot of sprints i never had any speed i didn't become a, a, a i didn't become the athlete i wanted to be until i had that experience too so 
a lot to be said, but we weren't, that's another podcast. We'll just, we'll just critique both co- coaches in another podcast. Yeah, we'll, so we'll get on that to tomorrow. 2000, exactly, tomorrow. 2008 Olympic trials. I noticed that you didn't crack 50 seconds, and I was very disappointed in the 100-meter freestyle. But you went to 2008. How old were you in 2008? Uh, 18. 18. Yeah, yeah. So, so what did you go? You went 50.34 in the 100-meter free. You got 40th. Oh, the big wow. show. And but you got 28th in the 50 free, uh, 22, eight, uh, 18 years old, legit swims, uh, a crate. That was the first Omaha trials. Um, how did you, I mean, what was, well, here's the thing. You're 18 year old kid and you're going to this huge freaking platform. And it, and it, and this, it, it had been before it just wasn't quite this way. Okay. What was it? It was 2000. It was an indie 2004. Right. It was, it was, um, where was it in 2004? It was outside. It was the outside venue in Southern California. God, I can't believe I'm, I'm, I, I went there. I hosted a bunch of people there and we partied while we That's watched the, the trials that um, we drove down from Los Angeles, but it was a great Olympic trials. But Omaha is, is a, is bigger by a factor of like 10. Oh, so yeah. 18 year old kid, what's it like walking out in that and before that crowd? Uh, jarring first off obviously very jarring you know the biggest crowd that i had at that point walking out and seeing was you know at texas state championships probably which was maybe you know two thousand people max i'd say filling out the ut swim center but that was a very jarring experience and that's when it's because i wasn't i had i hadn't really had a big international you know career or anything like that i wasn't at i wasn't at the top swim meets uh, in a major capacity during those times. So that was kind of, you know, my, you know, baptizing into the, you know, USA swimming community, uh, community. So it was just insane. It, uh, I really experienced a whole lot. I, the hardest part about it all was that I didn't have, I was a member of wave and I didn't have a lot of people on my team with me at the Olympic trial. So it's kind of, they're all alone. Right. So I thought that that was pretty difficult to be, to be, to be at that meet like a meet like that without the support of all your teammates, which, you know, changed on my next two Olympics, obviously. But I thought that that it was a little bit intimidating. Uh, It gave me some good experience. I know a lot of, cause I had such a, a, a good year that year in high school swimming. I know a lot of my friends and teammates and, uh, and coaches and, you know, Uh, people that don't know that much maybe about the sport expected me to like make the Olympic team. And that was never my goal in 2008. It would have been really great. Let me tell you what, but I knew that it wasn't super realistic for me to be thinking about making that team quite yet. So I was really using it as an experience to, to use knowing that in four years, it would be a very fair chance that I would probably be in that final trying to make the team. So I thought it was a, it was a nice little walkthrough of the, of the meet before the big show in 2012 for me. 2009 freshman year with Eddie, correct? Uh, so what, something happened that year because by 2009 uh, trials, you're, you're making the world. You're, so what did you go in 2009 trials? You were, oh, oh my God, you're, you're not third place club. You were seventh in the 100 meter freestyle, yeah. but you dropped down to a 48.6. That's right. At, at, at World Trials in 2009. Ooh. Ooh. Oof. That, Ooh. Was, uh, that was quite the meet. I remember Ricky beat me out by, I think, like two one hundredths of a second or something crazy. Um, and my roommate was Jackson Wilcox at the time who had punched his ticket for the mile. And we had kind of been looking at going to Rome together and, and uh, having this great time at our first major international meet. And uh, it just wasn't in the cards for me that year. Uh, but I'd ha- I did see a major improvement. That was the year of the suit suit too. So like, I don't know where that, you know, where you draw the line on what my actual improvement versus suit time improvement was, but uh, I definitely improved. There's no doubt about that. And I knew that although I didn't have quite the performance that I wanted in terms of the place that I finished, I knew that I was in a good spot moving forward and that hopefully it was only going to get better. Seventh place in the final at trials for any trials meet in the hundred meter freestyle is the third place club. Welcome buddy. I'm in the third place club too. <laughs> Brutal, right? You know, Brutal. there's lots of tears. Did you, cry? did you cry? Uh, I'm sure I did. I'm sure I did. It was very I, I didn't cry. You're a weenie. 
<laughs> no, no, it's, 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 it's a tough spot. It's good. It's character building and that's entirely fine. Um, by the time you went to 2011 WUGS, you, you, you dropped three gold medals. Uh, World University Games. I'm not making a joke about World University Games, but where do you keep those medals? Do you know where they're you got at? Medals? <laughs> uh, I have no idea, but I do remember. I do remember the the WUGS medals were awesome that year. They were where cool. They? Oh, man, I wish I. I know I saw them maybe like five or six years ago. I don't know where they are, but those were cool medals. I got to hand it to the Chinese. They really, they, they did good work on those. I'm being a bit of an asshole, but, but I do ask everybody where their WUGS gold, where their WUGS medals are. And nobody, nobody can answer me. I, it's, because, I it's because the, the, some parent memory holder has them, but uh, you know, a great performance and uh, a great a great way to crack into team usa and be successful was it a confidence builder for you absolutely and you got a great team aspect on that trip right you know a lot of uh, up and comers and uh, people that you had kind of been seeing and you were racing against at nc2a's and you finally get to call them a teammate they're not they're no longer like your your sworn enemy right so that was a, it was a it was a good experience to segue from college into world you know USA swimming. It was a really great segue into that because we weren't going to be competing against these people. We were going to be competing with these people. So uh, and it was a great squad. It was a really great squad that year. So I thought I loved it. I thought it was a cool experience. It learn. I forget which coach, but learn, get comfortable being uncomfortable was what that trip was about. So the food wasn't great as Wug's food, I think has a, a fair reputation for that. Uh, you know, none of the stuff, n- none of the things were perfect there and none of the things were as fine tuned as they are at say a Pampax or a world or a, obviously an Olympics, but it was a really good way to just kind of, you know, just tinker with your, with the process a bit so that you can be successful when it really, when push really came to shove. And I thought it did a really great job of preparing us for that. If I don't, if I don't talk about the college years, uh, our audience will lose their minds because <laughs> we, we have to talk about it. Um, is, is, you know, is there a moment, is there a turning point, a pivotal point, something that, that happened for you at, at university of Texas where everything clicked and you're like, I'm a man and I'm going to swim fast. Absolutely. And I think this is more in terms of uh, the swimmer. It's a very personal thing, right? It's a, uh, it's, it happens at in a, any different time under a number of circumstances and it's different for everybody. So that's for me, that first year I had never really been a part of a, of a real team, right? My club team had very few people. They weren't, uh, it wasn't a big club team. Not a lot of people going to nationals and, and stuff. Uh, and my high school team was great, but such a crazy, huge uh, range of, of potential uh, and, uh, and talent and ability there. But now at Texas, everyone's good. You know, nobody's, nobody's bad at swimming at Texas for sure. And, finally everybody working for this common goal because swimming is such an individual sport right especially the pre-college days it's a you know it's a team sport right but it's really just comes down comes down to individuals to your individual performance and if somebody else does great well that's fantastic and you get to cheer for them and be a part of that success but it doesn't really matter to you whether your team wins or loses college is way different college is it's it's Every swim matters. Every performance matters, and I and I thrived on that. I loved it. I loved the uh, the team aspect and how it you know it's a bunch of moving parts coming together to make this machine that hopefully goes and wins an NCAA championship. But that was just an incredible opportunity to be at Texas, and that first year was a crazy year. Uh, and I just remember I got taken off of the uh, four by one hundred medley. I was not, it was, I think Dave anchored it. Dave Walters anchored it instead of me. And I remember being like a little disappointed, but I knew that that was probably the right choice for the team. And then we had 
100 free, I got the opportunity to stand up and show what I could do in the 100 free. And I ended up getting second that year, as I did every year at NCAAs. So, uh, you know, good old Nathan. Um, but I ended up getting second. That was a real breakout performance for me. It was a, it was a very special moment for me. It's, it's finally when I think that I crossed that threshold from being a, a pretty good swimmer to being, uh, you know, somebody to look out for and somebody to watch. So that was a really important year for me, that freshman year in NCAA is at Texas A&M. Uh, and we, it, it also had its, you know, a bittersweet moment, right? So we got second that year to Auburn and we ended up, uh, you know, we were up big on day two and we ended up, you know, losing to Auburn. Auburn put up like four in the, in the 200 back or something, some event and, 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 you know, eclipsed us there. So that was, we got to, I got to taste some, you know, a little bit of success and a little bit of defeat. So those were some, some powerful moments for me. And uh, I remember we had to watch Auburn celebrate at the very end, jump in the pool with their coaches and staff and everyone having a great time. And, Eddie and Chris made us watch so that we could hopefully bring it back and and never have to feel that way again, as they put it. And the following year, you know, we did it. So I think it was a, it was a pretty memorable year in 2009, not one that uh, is the most joyous, you know, uh, uh, highlight reel of my career or my life, but definitely a stepping stone to get me to where I, where I would be eventually. 2012, everything clicked for you. Um, <clears throat> I thought you would, I thought you would talk about 2012, but no. Yeah. I mean, that, they all have their special moments. 2012, I could elaborate on for it. I wish we had a couple more hours. I could tell you all about it. 2012 might be a standalone. We'll just, uh, I tell you what, we'll come back and we'll do just Texas and we'll do, the, we'll do just Texas and the Eddie Reese critique for now. Let's, let's move to 2012 trials. And because, uh, you know, you, you've been to the big show, 2008, um, fifth in the 100 freestyle, 48-8. Yes. yes. And uh, what, what, what was interesting about the, the 2012 Olympic Games is, and I forgot this, you let off the relay. Oh, yeah, that's right. I did. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like I've, that, Completely I forgot. Am I crazy? Did I like, did something happen? I'm like. No, but you went from 48-8, but you went to a leadoff in the, in the four by one, and you let it off in 48-4. And, and, you know, and I know that um, maybe not the – maybe not – you didn't get on the podium where you wanted to be, but um, that's a tough – that's a tough pill. Uh, I, was, I was a bronze medalist at the Olympics in the four by two relay, and I remember I should have been happy and I was bitter. Um, you know, what was that experience like for you in 12? Uh, it – in which part would you like me to to really emphasize the uh, swimming on the prelims instead of the finals, or just the experience in general? The experience in general. Go, yeah, yeah. Break it down. Unpack it for us. Uh, so first off, walking into 2012 trials versus walking into 2008 trials was a completely different monster. At this point, I had been through NCAA's. I'd been through a very rigorous college program. I had done very well at NCAA's, and I had done pretty well the last four years previous. So I knew walking into 2012, it was kind of like a mind to lose type thing. And it's so funny because I, I get into, I'm sure all, most swimmers do, but you get into these routines and you get into these, uh, um, these just patterns that you go through before a race, right? Rituals, I think is what people like to call them. And I always listen to music. And I remember hearing at 2008 at the semifinals, my favorite song at the time came up uh, and it was our walkout song and it was M83's Midnight City. And I remember, I remember hearing that song and being like, okay, for sure. I'm, I'm about to make a final because i you know, this is a sign for sure. Uh, so I ended up going to 48-4 uh, in, the, in the semifinal to get me into the finals. I would think I was seated like third, second or third or something. And that day, and this shows, this shows my inexperience, uh, I didn't get up all day out of bed that, uh, the day of the final. I didn't get out. I, I should have gotten up and done a morning swim, wake up swim. I should have been moving around, keeping my blood flowing, but I didn't. And I just wanted to conserve all my energy, sat in bed all basically all day. And I think that it ended up, uh, I didn't have time to wake up. So I ended up adding, I think 0.4 and getting fifth. 
uh, which was that was a little disappointing. But at the same time, making the Olympic team, uh, you know, pretty happy. But in in terms of the my experience at the Olympics themselves, it's so funny because you come out and I had that experience where I walk into trials and I feel like okay, I know what I'm doing. I've done this a million times. I'm ready to go. But then I walk into the Olympics and I feel like a freshman walking into the first college practice, right? It's totally different. It's, it's, it's just crazy uh, the difference there is. And I remember one of the first days, now I don't like to toot my own horn, but I am really good at O bubbles. I can do some really great O ring bubbles. And I remember the first day uh, Phelps was on the bottom of the pool doing some O bubbles and I jumped in and like I messed up his O bubble or something. And all the coaching staff was like, Rawr! like, how could you mess up the bubbles? And I was like, oh man, like I better learn where I am on this totem pole here. So, uh, so much shame, um, so much shame. shame, 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 but it was still, uh, it was again, a learning experience as most things in life are. And, and I picked it up pretty, pretty quickly. And I had a lot of friends out there, uh, who really, uh, on and off the team that kind of, you know, built me up. So I was happy with that performance of that 48, four was it tied my best time. And I remember one of my coaches, earlier in my career told me that if you go the same time in prelims that you do in finals, that was probably your best swim, right? That's probably the most you had in you. So uh, I was literally the exact same time, I think maybe a hundredth off or something. So I knew that that was the best that I had that 48, four at the time. So I was happy just to be able to do it, happy to be able to get our, our team in the right spot so they could, uh, so they could show up at finals and, and they did a really great job at finals, you know, can't be, can't be too mad with a silver medal, uh, which is, my first medal and and a great memory. Where is that silver medal? Now I know where that one is. So that one's upstairs in my sock drawer. You know, when my when when my wife's had a couple glasses of wine, she likes to take that out. So I think that she wears it more than I do these days. Uh, just making sure. It, 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 <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty textbook. That's right. That's right. Um, I, my apologies. Is is your wife? Was she a former swimmer? Is she a non swimmer? No, non-swimmer hates like all sports, if you can believe it. So like not impressed at all with my swimming uh, career. No idea. I went to the Olympics. Uh, so, and that's why I like, that's what I liked about her. You know, I liked that she didn't know anything about swimming and that and she liked me for who I was because let me tell you what, she does not like me because I went to the Olympics. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah, I think she, if sense. she could have it her way, she would say she would ixnay that whole part of my life. But uh, um, she, she's just been really great and really supportive throughout this entire law school process. So um, yeah, no, she's not a swimmer and you'll never see her in the water. The weirdest thing, she flips out when her fingers get wrinkly, like really weirds her out. So like couldn't be more opposite in that aspect. Um, yeah, my wife's a non-swimmer. We'll leave it there. So, you know, yeah, I, I got you. We're, we, we have lots of parallels, buddy. 2013 world championships. Um, you know, you're, it, this is a, this is a great meet for you. The, you know, four by one, you guys got silver. Uh, my fault, free, you got your silver, but you cracked 48 second with 48, 47, eight, two. And you out touched Nathan Adrian. Uh, First time, only time I ever did that, by the way. Yeah, it, 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 was, it was a big, it was a big summer. Um, so what was happening that summer and, and what was clicking for you? So I think what happened, I had a really great, uh, really great year that year for one, because it was my first professional year. I wasn't a member of the college team. First time as a pro uh, at training with UT. So I took a, I took a lot of personal responsibility inside of my workouts and I took a lot. Uh, I really, I made this sport my life more so than it was in college and also, I started dialing back on some of the stuff that Eddie, uh, I guess I stopped doing like 200s for time and stuff, right? I knew I was only doing 50 and 100. I knew I would, at that point, never swim another 200 again in my life. So I kind of dialed it back. And I think that had a really good, uh, uh, I think that I had these four years of base built up from Ed. So I think that that really helped kind of like a, almost like a super taper, if you will, that I was just so on it that year because of all the work that I had done that I really think that that helped me grow a lot and, and let me do some times that, I, you know, that wouldn't have been possible the previous year. So I, 
that was the great part about that. Now the sad, the, the disappointing part about that was I took that success from 2013 and I thought that, well, as a, I think I was what, like it was 2013. So, you know, 23, 24 years old. I, let me tell you, I had all the answers back then. I knew everything. Nobody could tell me anything about swimming. I had been doing it for 20 years and I knew everything about it. And I didn't, absolutely not. And, but I thought I did. And that's a really dangerous thing. When you think you, you, when you don't know what you don't know, right? That's a really dangerous, dangerous method of thinking. And my next two years of training reflected that Eddie was doing his best to keep me on track. And, you know, especially after the Olympics, you just get, you're, you start getting pulled a whole bunch of different ways. And it's really difficult to be able to compartmentalize that and, and to say this you know, swimming is one A and then everything else falls in line behind that. I kind of forgot about that for a bit. And, you know, my performance in 2014 was not good. And my performance in 2015 was absolutely abysmal. So those two years were a direct reflection of, of what, of the success I had in 2013. And I, and it hurt. It pains me to say that if I could go back in time, I'd change some things around, but hopefully somebody watching this interview will be under that same similar thing when they're, you know, when they believe that they have all the answers and just sometimes it's always good to get that, you know, mile high view and see maybe there are some things that I don't yet realize that I don't yet know. No, that's very dangerous. And uh, I appreciate you in retirement reflecting back and, and being honest about it. I'm an uh, adult. And now I'm old. Now I can see old that. man, right? I know, I know. But it, so, there, so we told everybody we would talk about this, and uh, and and I'm I'm, I'm going to frame it up this way. I cannot imagine uh, having an entire career as successful as you have had, and um, and then going to the biggest platform in sport and winning gold. And so you snatched your gold. You got your second medal, baby. It's gold. And then at the same time, this thing happens. So. That had to feel like you were just, it had to feel like whiplash. Take us to the, the sense of accomplishment of standing atop the podium, hearing the national anthem, and then you can dovetail into what happened. <laughs> um, you know, I knew that was my last year swimming. I knew that after that, I would never get into another pool again. So I knew that after that swim that my swimming career that I have been, that has been literally my identity my identity um for the last what 20 23 years some huge amount of time my whole life for all intents and purposes but i knew it was over and i knew it was done and i was really i was excited to end on such a good note uh i would have loved to have been on that final relay but you know that's one of the the joys and pitfalls of being on the usa team right like <laughs> your team is so good. And that, and I can say with 100% certainty that the guys on that final relay were the guys that should have been on that final relay. They did a great job. And uh, that was kind of where Caleb Dressel's career began to blossom. And now it's just in full bloom now, but that's where it really began to become uh, where he began to see the potential that he had as, as a swimmer. So, I mean, those, and, uh, and Ryan held obviously, you know, uh, the pressure cooker. He's obviously an incredible swimmer as well. And then, you know, Nathan and Phelps, I'm not going to give you any promos on them because they don't need any, but they, uh, it was just this incredible, uh, this incredible coming together of, you know, two decades of work. And that was really great. And I got, although it, it I wish I would have been in the water. It was nice to experience that with my family, with my mom and my dad, who, have been my biggest supporters and my biggest fans and, and who have for who have sacrificed the most out of anybody to see me be there. So I thought that that was a really cool moment. And I'm, uh, I'm glad I got to experience it in the way that I did in the capacity that I did, but moving on from there, you know, it's, let me, let me tell you that, that four by 100, it gets done on day two or, you know, maybe day one now, but, uh, it gets done real early. So you have about a week of, of watching swimming, which is great. You know, it's, you're at the Olympics. Who wouldn't love to watch the swim meet? And it's awesome. And I love it. It's just that like, you know, it's like 15 sessions and they're all like three hours long. And I remember hearing madness, 
uh, I forget the band's name, uh, but Madness was, I guess, the Olympic song in 2016. I heard that song no less than 500 times. I can't even hear it to this day because they would just play it on repeat in the stadium the entire time. So it was, it's now time to, you know, go out and have some fun. And, and we went out and did that. And uh, I wish it had turned out differently, man, do I wish it had turned out differently because it was, it was quite the whiplash, right? Like going out and having fun with all of your buddies and, uh, and it turning into what it did was just such a shame. And it, it's a shame on, uh, so many different people, right. On me, myself, right. Uh, on Ryan, on, on the real police department, there's just so many places where this could, this very small, inconsequential, stupid thing. There were so many checks and balances for it to go away. And we just surpassed all those and it became a worldwide phenomenon. Were you in the wrong place at the wrong time? Yeah, I was. Wrong place, I mean, wrong time. yeah, yeah. It was it was the wrong wrong place, wrong time. But again, a product of immaturity, I'd say for sure. Um, there were some things that I wish I had done differently, obviously. But there are some things that I wouldn't have really changed too much, right? It, it just became this. Both Jack Gunner and I, for sure we got caught in between these two opposing forces, right? We, uh, we had Ryan who, uh, who had had not the Olympics that he had wanted um, and had a, a, you know, as Ryan has been known to do in the past, not so much anymore, but Ryan, you know, likes knows how to have fun and knows how to celebrate. So, and then the comments that he made, which were not great comments and not true comments, reflected poorly on the Brazilian police department and the Brazilian police department wanted to get him back. Right. They wanted, you know, they wanted to get, they wanted to hit Ryan just like they got hit and made up this lie about us busting down a bathroom door and peeing all over a, a you know, breaking mirrors and breaking soap dispensers, which none of that obviously ever happened, but we were just caught between these two opposing forces at, you know, where the magnifying glass is up to electron microscope status at the Olympics where it was just taken by the media and blown up into this huge thing. And let me just tell you, it wasn't a big thing. It wasn't that big of a deal. You know, it was, we're talking about a Coca-Cola advertisement and peeing in, in some grass and it got blown up into this. So that it was a shame to do that. And I, I felt some massive repercussions from that. And I felt them for a long time. And it personally hurt me a whole lot to be a part of that because I felt like my legacy had been kind of tarnished a bit and, you know, for a period of time it was, uh, but all those things coming together really taught me a whole lot, uh, about so many things about outside of swimming about life and relationships and friendships and, and the legal community and what to do and what not to do and who to trust. So all these things kind of came together in this, you know, absolute, you know, S show for lack of a better term um, to, to create this monster. And it, I don't love it, but at this point I've kind of made peace with, with everything that's happened. And I understand that I'm a better person as a result. So that's kind of where we went with it. From the outside looking in, we, 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 we saw the story just gaining momentum and a few folks, a few people, like a few people who are, some people started to break it down. And when they started to break down the details, it was pretty clear what the story was and why this was happening. But the media wanted to make it the, the ugly American and about Ryan at the time. And, um, but being a part of it, it's, it, it's just, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was heartbreaking. It was tough. Heartbreaking. But, uh, heartbreaking. Yeah. And, but it, the funny thing is, um, you know, it becomes this small thumbnail in your memory and you almost forget about it, but it's, uh, but, but I didn't live through it. Right. Yeah. No. And I mean, it was hard. And let me tell you what, those three days stuck in, in Brazil were real tough, you know, really, really tough there. Uh, I got some crazy stories about just all the, all the inner workings of the, the Brazilian court system and, 
uh, getting onto a plane when you are, when you want a whole nation of people trying to kill you or, or something. So it was, uh, it was bodyguards. Did you have bodyguards at any? Oh man. So like people were mad. People were very, very mad. So I had like Homeland security guys like on walkie talkies with me at all times. I remember when I had to, when I was flying out, they took me through this, like I went through my own customs office and they put me on like a, in a pickup truck and we were driving on the runway with like 737s, like weaving in and out of plane tires to like get me to like the, the beverage cart service to walk me into the back of this plane. And then when I'm on the plane, I have my hood up, I'm looking down and I hear everybody around me talking about it. And it's just like, Oh, get me out of here. Get me home. And I get off the plane and somebody from TNZ is right there. Like any comment on this? I'm no. So it, it just evolved. It was crazy. It was absurd. Um, and it really just didn't have to. You should have sold your book rights, buddy. I know. Right. I mean, I thought about it for a while, but, uh, I was happy kind of leaving it where it was. Um, I thought that I had done, you know, I had done some, I wish I didn't pee on the grass, I guess. Right. Uh, but, and I wish that I had just told the Brazilian police that Ryan had torn down the sign. I didn't want, but Ryan was my best friend. I, you know, and I love Ryan to this day. Awesome dude. One of the best dudes I've ever known. And, uh, it, I didn't want him to get in bigger trouble because of something that I had said or so I just kind of, you know, I told him my side of the story and I didn't, I didn't include that part and to protect Ryan. And, you know, in retrospect, that wasn't the right move. Ryan was going to say what he wanted to say and do what he wanted to do. And that was, you know, Ryan's responsibility. And I shouldn't have put myself, you know, in that position to protect that. But I did because I was a stupid kid and didn't know any better. So that's kind of what happened. Well, you've been uh, very vulnerable here. We appreciate it. And I think everybody, a lot, a lot of people live through those emotions with you, even though you may have felt like you were alone. So the, the most important question is this, is Ryan going to make the Olympic team in 2021? You know, I hope so. You know, uh, I would never bet against Ryan. You know, I, I never would bet against Ryan, but the, it's just so fast these days. It's crazy. What are these kids doing? Like, it's insane how fast everybody is. Uh, I'm just blown away across the board in high school, you know, 12 and under the Olympics and, you know, worldwide, everyone's getting crazy fast. So, uh, but I would never put it past Ryan. And I know Ryan is really working hard. So, I'm cheering for him and I wish him nothing but the best because he's a really great dude. He just got caught in a bad situation that he made worse. Okay. How important is the Texas orange and white meat when to, you know, cause we were just at it. I was just, we discovered it. Crazy uh, times, huh? It was, no, it was great. I mean, I, I'm watching it and, and, and nine seventeen was last and a thousand free and like, last like way 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 behind and i was like oh, 917 is 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 a, is a is a great swim in a thousand seriously but i was like i remember i wasn't even paying attention i was like who's feeling 917 and like so, coming up so far behind in the rear and i'm like oh it's 917 <laughs> i mean that, yeah the orange and white meat was fast it, it, what was it was the the depth of of of, of the team is apparent but uh, I've just yeah. I've grown to become used to that, right? Texas is just they've had depth every year since like I you know before I was even there. Like it's crazy, and that orange and white meat is a huge showcase for that because they're not really going to do anything easy until we have invite in December. All right, we're going to bring you back, and we're gonna we're gonna nerd out on some other swim nerd stuff, and we're gonna we're gonna focus on college. Will you come, will you come back? Of course. I, I just have plenty of time. I'm only doing billables these days. So I got billable hours. So, uh, <laughs> but no, I have plenty of time. I always love rehashing memories, especially with old friends like you, Mel. And uh, I love any piece of advice that I can give that can maybe maybe help a little, uh, a little future swimmer, a future Olympian become, you know, the become the people holding the flag and on the podium. So I'm, I'm really appreciative of the opportunity to help as much as I can and give whatever insight I can because now I'm a first year lawyer and I don't know what I'm doing. So I want to kind of relate back to what I was doing when I was a swimmer and like cutting the new a little bit better. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. 
Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swim Podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.